Two. This is a meeting of the Ferndale Public Schools Board of Education held on Monday, December 14th, 2015. The meeting is being recorded for broadcast on cable and on the district's YouTube channel. All meetings in the Ferndale schools are held in public in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Printed documents discussed in tonight's meeting are available to the public uh, on our website and on request with the exception of any information protected by student or employee privacy rights. Board meeting information is posted on our website at ferndaleschools.org. If you don't have internet access uh, and need that information, please contact the board offices at 248-586-8652 by Thursday of the week prior to the meeting, and district staff will do their best to assist you. So with that, uh, may we have a roll call, please, Ms. Shepard? She is at a city council meeting. And President O'Donnell. Here. <coughs> Thank you. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does any board member have any uh, amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, uh, by unanimous consent, the agenda is considered approved, and we'll move on to our uh, presentation by UHS school leader, Brian Offord. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Superintendent Pruitt, board members, uh, central administration, community members. Uh, my name is Brian Alford. And uh, it's my first introduction to many of you. I am the student leader of uh, family and student affairs at University High School. And uh, as soon as we get the projector up and going, I'll go through the presentation. Mr. Good, if you could dim the lights a little bit. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I didn't do all this great work by myself. This is definitely a collaborative effort. Uh, Ms. Jeffries and Mr. Beatty, the other two principals there, uh, we'd like to welcome you to uh, some of our initiatives and focus for this year. Uh, we like to call it our Year of Awesomeness. So uh, three of our focus um, initiatives, uh, the first is a PD focus for staff this year uh, for culture and student engagement and questioning and discussion uh, for us to all grow in our practice around high level engagement activities and workshop model instruction. Um, for example, uh, we have our teachers uh, reading three books. Uh, one is on helping students grow and questioning skills, uh, teaching students of poverty, and also standards-based grading. Uh, next, we have growing our new and returning partnerships with universities. And then lastly, our ILTs, um, instructional lead teacher uh, team, initiatives, and college prep activities. So this year, we have some new additions. Uh, we like to start off the school year with what we call first four days, which is an opportunity uh, because we have so many students coming from different uh, area schools uh, coming together at one at UHS is uh, we do um, four days of activities to help them get acclimated to the UHS climate um, as well as get acclimated to each other and some of the changes we had this year were for the juniors and seniors who had already been through that process we had a leadership conference um, so we took them through some different activities um, some workshops to kind of help them uh, see how their role as upperclassmen plays a part in the culture as well as helping uh, the younger ninth and 10th graders to know how to follow the UHS way is what we like to call it in our building. Uh, the College Focus Day, we had uh, panelists uh, from former UHS graduates come in and talk to the students. Uh, they always like the scavenger hunt, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then the College Facts presentation is what I really enjoyed uh, with the Wayne State College Fair. So we had different colleges coming to our gymnasium from Wayne State and a lot of the younger students usually don't 
a lot of times get to uh, interact with the colleges until they get into upper class grades. So with having, you know, about three or four different colleges from Wayne State there, the ninth and 10th graders had an opportunity to go around the gym um, and just see how it was to be at a college fair and get some pretty good information to get started in their high school career. Uh, next we had uh, on the 17th, Stand Up to Bullying, um, which we kind of changed it up. We had anti-bullying, which is kind of teaching kids don't be a bully, but we want the, the student body to grow and not just having people be bystanders, but to learn how to step in and advocate for others, um, stick together and stand up for each other. So we had stations by grade level, um, and then they created banners to put up in the school. Uh, the other great out, uh, opportunity they had, they had a public service announcement workshop where we allowed them to use their technology, um, and they had to go into the hallways in groups and create a public service announcement for standing up to bullying. So those were some pretty cool videos to, ch to take a look at. Um, then we have um, our Subway uh, partnership is with, um, our PBIS partnership is with Subway. Um, so we use those within the building to give the kids positive rewards for when we see them doing pretty good things in the school. And we just like to feed them as well. <laughs> they love to go and eat. Uh, just a few pictures of some of the activities that we did on the first four days. Um, the two students on the right are two of our senior students um, who are involved in DECA, and we're working together right now on a project um, where they want to just kind of bring awareness to students to be able to take ownership of, you know, we all have different strengths, uh, different challenges, and so we're kind of working collaboratively uh, to work together as a whole school to do that project, so um, they've been putting in some good work. Uh, fall semester, um, as many of you know, our seniors go down to Wayne State for half of the day. Uh, this year will be for half of the year, and we like to consider this part of their immersion experience, which is part of the foundation of University High School, um, and what we like to tell people is going to help benefit them in the long run. So they've been going down um, and having these different activities. They had the welcome panel, uh, where you have different colleges come and talk, um, different people from different areas of the college come and talk to the students, um, as well as uh, visiting different uh, colleges at the university. So they go into the psychology department, uh, engineering department, um, and a lot of the professors that are part of the Wayne State Advisory Board have been very supportive. Um, they've been very outgoing and helping to support our students getting into those different colleges down there to see what that's all about. Uh, they go into the library, do a scavenger hunt, um, and get acclimated to the different services in the library. Um, the C2 pipeline, uh, the money, some of the money that they were granted through their grants, um, and the C2 pipeline is an after school program where we partner with Wayne State um, and help the students in science and math we were able to take some of our senior students and go down and they built a state-of-the-art uh, lab on the Wayne State campus for this program. And so our science teacher spoke today, and that was one of her celebration uh, speaking points, is that she was so excited that our students were able to operate within a state-of-the-art lab and really have a great experience down at Wayne State. Um, another part of uh, our focus with our partnerships is the 3D uh, printing, uh, which was a donation uh, where we're working with the C2 pipeline as well. And our students have been working with some of our teachers uh, with this program. And I think the last thing that they created with the 3D printer were whistles. So you just hear kids going around blowing whistles, but it's pretty cool when, if you've ever seen it uh, to see how you can create things with uh, a 3D printer. It's pretty awesome. Uh, another part of uh, extending our partnerships, um, we've really been working on this, is that um, <coughs> the teaching, student teaching lab school. So right now we have 16 um, pre-student teachers within our building, and they've paired them with various different teachers. Um, but what's been really been beneficial is that it gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to help some of our other students that may need help in various areas in smaller group settings. Um, so in some classrooms, we actually have two student teachers um, along with, you know, the primary teacher. So it's really been quite helpful. Sometimes you go into the room and you see two or three kids in there 
really engaged in learning um, and then as well as student teacher really having a great experience to be able to um, you know work with students on a smaller scale another part is our Baker College early uh, college program currently we have 32 juniors from our school um, enrolled in this program across the four different majors um, they go at various times to the actual Baker College um, campus um, and do various activities. Right now they go to and do their online classes four days a week and on one day out of the week they come over to uh, Ferndale High School where they actually meet with their professor and do work um, in their program with their professor. Uh, currently at this time um, they've had some experiences. I know one day I saw the kids in the lunchroom with the uh, garden fresh with the nachos and the salsa and I'm like man where all of this stuff come from so they started to tell us about their experience and going to garden fresh and um, how enlightening it was and they seemed like they really enjoyed themselves um, and you know having that connected to their education seemed like it was really a good experience for them um, so this is all connected to the blending learning model um, and as I expressed, they had online courses um, several days a week and then come over here for their instruction with their professors. Uh, just some more pictures of the students operating in the lab down at Wayne State, um, I believe on the right um, and also on the left. Um, it's just been good. They, I think they just recently had a panel down at Wayne State as well and I know when I was going down as the college transition um, advisor the students really really absorb um, when you have people that are closely more closely related to their age and they talk to them about that experience of going to college the different pitfalls and what have you but they really have their uh, ears open to hear from them so that's a good immersion experience ILT led uh, school initiatives and extended learning opportunities. Um, these are some things from last year. Uh, got science program, uh, Little Bits Engineering Activity, Authors Inc., um, which is an after school writing club. Uh, the students have really started to get into that. They actually published a book last year, um, and we have that um, in the office, and it's really been a great work to just see them grow in that area. Uh, the SAT camp. Uh, on Saturdays, we just had one this past Saturday. Uh, we had a pretty decent turnout, um, so Ms. Jeffries was actually over that. Um, it's a pretty good deal. And then what we have new for this um, coming year, the SAT Word of the Week app for juniors. So again, using technology, um, our ILTs have created uh, the little scan codes, and they have them posted all over the building so the students can go through, and when they see one, use their phone, scan it, and then it'll pull up the Word of the Week and just something, you know, to kind of keep the kids engaged um, and let them know that the SAT is coming uh, and you do want to continue to keep working anytime that you have an opportunity to grow. Uh, monthly Tech Club, club, again, working with the 3D printer, um, upcoming APSA Endurance Workshop. Uh, this is a focus that we have to really try to help the students get more stamina. Uh, you know, when you're taking any type of standardized test, um, especially when you're doing an essay, you get tired, you get fatigued. So just like lifting weights, you want them to get more stamina mentally. Uh, so they created this opportunity for them uh, to write multiple, multiple essays and build their endurance before they get to the actual test. Uh, Standards-based grading monthly meetings, uh, the lunch bunch readings. Uh, we actually have one today where the teachers uh, send out articles and they come in um, you know, at their leisure and just kind of read and learn a little bit more about standards-based grading. And then I spy, <coughs> excuse me, uh, teachers just have an opportunity to collaborate, um, to continue to build that collaborative culture that we have at UHS. And, you know, teachers can go into each other's classrooms and just pick up little, um, you know, techniques and strategies uh, to be able to improve their practice. Uh, our Picture Perfect group had a wonderful opportunity. Uh, they went up to Lansing um, and they were, um, uh, awarded for their pur public service announcements. Uh, they got a chance to meet some state representatives um, and a senator. Um, then next we have our DECA uh, Operation Good Cheer. Uh, this is one of our largest student organizations and they go and they adopt um, 
several children and families. And when they do their fundraising activities, they actually donate um, those goods to the family. Um, and lastly, we have our partnership that we just started recently uh, with former uh, Principal Mr. Ivory and uh, Mr. Harris with the Southeast Oakland Coalition uh, Student Leadership Advocacy Group. Uh, so we had a recent meeting and we're just looking forward to the positive uh, student leadership activities that we're going to partake in and just continue to build our students up in that area. Anybody have any questions for me? All right. Work, Mr. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alfred. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, our student representative section of the meeting, and I see Sunasia Smith is here from UHS. So come on, hobble on up to the podium. <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing? Good, how are you? I'm good, crippled, but good. Um, speaking of crippled, um, just get right into it. Um, basketball season started, and um, <laughs> yeah, basketball season started, so I kind of got my injury. I got it Thursday. We were going against uh, Berkeley, and that was a little tough game, but um, I'll be okay, just in case anybody was wondering. Oh, yeah, um, was. Our JV boys um, are starting off to a good season. They play country day. And it was a tie, but they didn't go into overtime. So I guess it was a win-win kind of situation, I guess. <laughs> so um, varsity boys are doing well, too. Actually, this week, um, we actually play together, like boys, uh, varsity boys, JV boys, and varsity girls. We play um, Pontiac tomorrow, and then Wednesday is officially our first home game. Our first home game was actually supposed to be last week against you Prep, but it was scheduling difficulties, so. We didn't play them. Um, we played Madison Heights. And then Saturday, everybody's looking forward to our game against Ferndale. That's an exciting game. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Mr. Alfred pretty much touched on everything I was going to talk about. So <laughs> um, the Wayne State University events, um, Senior Capstone Day with panel discussion from Wayne State students in different majors. So different students talked about their majors and asked questions and stuff like that. Um, Mrs. Thomas's biochemistry students worked in the lab. You saw those pictures. And uh, Mr. Rabel's senior composition classes worked in the um, Wayne State University Library with the Wayne State University staff on this, this senior research paper, trying to get like an actual feel for what it would actually be like in college for your research papers. Because I've gotten like a lot of emails kind of like from the students that graduated last year, the seniors graduated last year. Oh my God, I have a paper. I have like two papers this week. So it's crazy. So that's really exciting. Um, Deca Districts is this Wednesday. They leave Wednesday, so Ms. Watkins is looking forward to a great little competition for there. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, Art Club, we have that almost every day. It's a few students that go. Um, I try to participate when I can, kind of everywhere right now. But besides that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Any questions, concerns, comments? When do you get to lose that brace? Um, hopefully in a couple of days, because it was a lot worse, like a uh, worse uh, Thursday. I was in crutches. It was just so so painful, very painful. <laughs> so hopefully in a couple of days. All right. Thank you Great. for asking. Awesome. Great. Have you guys received pieces previously made? No, I haven't, but it sounds very exciting. So <laughs> it sounds really cool. So hopefully I'll get a chance to do that too. I can work my way around. So. Great. All right. All right. Thank you very much. You're Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, have a great break if we don't see you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Crystal here from uh, UHS. No, she, no, she was not available okay. this evening. All right, then we'll uh, ask Mr. Shelton to come up and uh, present our Eagles of the Month. Thank you very much. As you know, uh, we've started this program this year to, on a monthly basis, acknowledge uh, both teachers and support staff <coughs> who uh, go above and beyond to really make a difference uh, uh, for our district. And uh, this is our Eagle of the Month program. And I have tonight a support staff person, an elementary teacher, and a secondary teacher that I'm proud to uh, give some public recognition to for all the good they do for our district and our kids. Um, the first person I'd like to uh, acknowledge is Mr. David Straka from the uh, uh, Career Center. And uh, if you'd like to come on, Mr. Straka. 
Uh, David was nominated by his supervisor, Pam Belliver, who's in the audience tonight, um, as is Mr. Straka's mother, from what I understand. My mom read your picture. <laughs> All right. Hey, Mom. Uh, I'd like to share a little bit of what uh, Ms. Belliver shared with me about David and his work at the Career Center. Uh, David is a career advisor. Uh, he is constantly working with other offices to upgrade the Career Center's forms and processes to incorporate new policies and remain compliant. Uh, David takes on additional responsibilities without concern or complaint and is always willing to help other coworkers with anything that they may need to, that they may need assistance with. He is always researching new ways to help customers and epitomizes teamwork. Um, and uh, Ms. Belliver nominated David actually for the last two months and uh, thank you for your persistence in helping us uh, get some right recognition for David. So congratulations. Our elementary school Eagle of the Month is uh, to my left, Miss Deb Hillebrand. Will you please stand? Deb teaches music at both Kennedy and at Roosevelt. Uh, she was nominated by Diana Keefe, who is in the audience tonight, to help us acknowledge Deb. Uh, here's what Miss Keefe shared with me about Deb. Deb is reflective and thoughtful about the music lessons that she engages the students with. She takes into account their needs and interests. She is an important part of the JFK and Roosevelt School families, giving 100% at both schools. Deb goes above and beyond by supporting other music programs in Ferndale and offering her support at evening concerts. Her support also extends to PTA, which in turn benefits all students. We're very proud to have you a part of our Ferndale family. Thank you. For our secondary teacher, Eagle of the Month, this worked out really well because this is also a, a teacher who's here for a different reason tonight as well, and that is uh, Rick Purinac. Could you please come on? Yeah. Rick was nominated by Sean Butler. Um, Rick is a uh, teacher at Ferndale Middle School as well as the cross country coach at the high school. Uh, Rick has built the Ferndale High School cross country program into a perennial league powerhouse over the last four years. Uh, this year the Eagles won the boys OAA league championship, two invitational meets, and two league jamboree meets. What is more impressive is the mentoring Rick has done with his athletes as individuals. He teaches them the true meaning of hard work and commitment. He is dedicated well beyond the athletic field mentoring students when they have problems teaching them the importance of being a good student and doing all this in a sport that does not have the recognition of big crowds or playing in front of their peers. Rick puts in insane hours for his student athletes as he works with them and for them year round. He is one of the most respected coaches in the state and one of the best coaches I've ever had in my tenure as athletic director. He exemplifies what a positive teacher and coach can bring out in our students. So congratulations. <laughs> back next month with uh, more good news, more good recognition to share. Thank right. you. Thanks, Mr. Shum. <clears throat> uh, and next up is our athletic award presentation. And uh, Mr. Good will be standing in for Mr. Butler. Yes, uh, Tom Shelton just, just mentioned with Mr. Purinex accomplishments, of course, uh, behind every great coach is even better players. So uh, what's really great tonight is we get a chance to honor some of the uh, uh, OAA champion cross country team members that are here with us today as well as we had a state qualifying swimmer as well um, so it's always great to see our individual athletes excel as well as our as well as our teams so uh, first if I could have McKenna Bellamy come up McKenna qualified <laughs> McKenna qualified for the state meet uh, in swimming in two events which events um, the 200 IM and the 100 fly and how'd you do I could have done better. <laughs> 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 Congratulations. Congratulations. Great job. Thank you very much. 
Uh, next, we have another state qualifier for uh, our cross country team, Mr. Will, McEl Will McElgin. Did I get that right? Yeah. yeah all right. <laughs> <laughs> Will was one of the, the spearheads of the, uh, of the cross country team, and you qualified for state as well. Um, how'd you do? Uh, I could have done better. <laughs> <laughs> Darn states. <laughs> I'm sure first. your mom has hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> and finally with us tonight is Mr. Jacob Keener. If you can come up too, please. <laughs> Jacob was another one of our fantastic members of the league champion cross country team. Congratulations. Obviously, a member of our robotics team, also. That's right. Excellent. So it was a fantastic fall for our sports. We're looking forward to an even better winter. So uh, we'll see you guys in a couple months with uh, some more athletic awards. All right. Thanks to the moms and dads too. And for <laughs> and for the parents and the students, I know you probably have a lot of different homework, so you don't need to stay around um, unless you really want to. But feel free to to head home and. <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right, we're going to move next to our uh, public comment. So as you know, this is the time for public participation in our meeting. Um, we want to make sure that all members of the public uh, have an opportunity to participate in the uh, work of the school district in many ways through emails, phone calls, meetings, town halls. Uh, and we want individual and group input into the important issues that face our schools. So at this time, um, I will invite anyone uh, who wants to comment to come up and form a line at the podium. Each speaker gets three minutes. Doesn't look like we'll need uh, uh, more than 30 minutes tonight. But uh, just ask that you follow uh, guidelines. If you need a response, please uh, state your name and address. Um, and uh, so the administrators can follow up with you if you need uh, any additional assistance. And uh, everybody gets. Uh, this opportunity to address the board both on agenda or non-agenda items. And finally, we just ask that any complaints about uh, staff be made outside of this uh, meeting and in the following the uh, standard um, board policy on public complaints, because we can't respond to any complaints in the meeting and that makes it more fair for, for both the complainant and uh, the person uh, that the complaint is directed to. So uh, anyone? Wish to uh, address the board this evening? Nope. All right. Oh, Ms. Amy? All right. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Nicole Amy. My address, can I say? No, I didn't write it down. Uh, just wanted to say something, I hope, briefly. Um, as some of you may know, I typically have no qualms letting you know if there is a problem. <laughs> so it occurred to me sometime today that maybe sometimes I don't let you know when you're doing something good. So don't be worried. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> uh, I already like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> My purpose here uh, right now is, I guess, just to let you know that I was pleasantly uh, surprised, well, not surprised, but I was very pleased to find out late last week that kindergarten classes are getting some support that is very much needed. And what I, what was even better about it was that myself or other parents didn't really have to 
advocate for it and that the administration did what I thought they should have done. And not that the parents didn't raise some concerns or plant a few bugs in some ears. But in any event, I do appreciate the hard work on that. It does mean a lot to myself and other parents. So thank you. Thank you. That's good feedback. And, yeah, I think parents planting a few bugs is always welcome, I think. Yes, Mr. Gray, you also consulted with the kindergarten teachers on exactly what form that support would take. So we appreciate that, too. Mr. Shelton's been keeping in contact with Ms. Keefe and the teachers, and it's actually a direct correlation to the budget amendment that we'll be talking about later. But due to being better off financially than the first forecast, we were able to take more money and put it back into the classroom, which is where I know as a board and administration where we want to be putting our funds. So we thank the parents and Ms. Keefe and Mr. Shelton and the whole team for doing this. All right. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the board this evening? All right. Well, we will close public comment and move to our consent agenda. The consent agenda is where we put routine matters that don't need any further discussion or have any questions asked about them. So on our consent agenda tonight, we have item 7.1, the request to approve minutes of the regular meeting of November 16th, 2015. 7.2 is a request to approve bills and accounts. 7.3 is a request to approve resignations and new hires. And item 7.4 is a request to approve a letter of intent for an insurance proposal. All of these items are in the board packet. Does any board member wish to remove any of the items from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Moved by Mr. Deegan Krauss and seconded by Ms. Butters. May we have a roll call, please? Butters? Yes. Deegan Krauss? Yes. Bonilla? Yes. Ms. Haas? Yes. Kinney? Yes. Ms. Bonilla? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes with six yes and zero no. So the consent agenda items are approved collectively. Item 8.1 is a request to approve the second reading of bylaw 0142.5, which is the process for filling a board vacancy. Do you want to present this? Okay. I'm trying to pull it up here. Give me a second. At the board, and this is our second reading, last month we presented this bylaw, updating our bylaw, since there were some concerns from the board governance committee regarding not having a robust process. If the board gets to a stalemate with multiple votes of 3-3, what would be that process? So this is what the governance committee has recommended. We had the first read last month, and it's looking to see if there's any questions after having the last month to review this. Is there a section on this that you're not sure? It's 44 and 45 of the packet. Yeah. Well, it's 48 if you're going through the public one. Okay. The public one has more pages. I don't know. It's page 48 for me. It's the way it downloads from the system. Maybe it's just spaced out differently. But, yeah, I was, like, trying to find it because, I don't know, your computer has it. But probably not. So I don't think the governance committee made any changes from last month. No. No, it moved it forward as is. All right. We can have more discussion when there's a motion, so I'll entertain a motion to approve the bylaw change made by Ms. Latosh, seconded by Mr. Deegan Krauss. Discussion on the motion? All right. Seeing none, we will move to a roll call, please. Deegan Krauss? Yes. Bonilla? Yes. Ms. Haas? Yes. Ms. Keeney? Yes. Ms. Butters? Yes. Ms. Bonilla? Yes. So with six yes votes and zero no, that motion passes, and the bylaw change is approved and will go into effect as of today, which we will use on January 4th. Item 8.2 is a request to approve the second read of our NEOLA policies, which were voluminous. Good evening again, everybody. You have in front of you a 
second read for the packet of Neola. You recall that Neola twice a year gives us these big packets of updates that they recommend for us based on legal and legislative changes. This particular packet from Neola, I went through it in detail at the last meeting. Most of the changes in there have to do with changes in federal procurement requirements. There are some in there from new USDA regulations, and there are some in terms of our district-wide weapons policies, which are really not a change in policy for us, just reaffirming, again, that our schools are all weapon-free zones. So I can answer any specific questions anybody has. That's kind of the highlights of what's in this Neola update. Any questions on the 140 pages of policies? Can you look for the standard? Yeah, I think they're just standard things bringing us into compliance. I'm just curious how often the proposed changes end up coming up in your interactions with the various union leaders and such, because obviously they go to their own meetings to hear what the legal changes are in the law. Sure. Do these end up coming up in those conversations as well? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. You know, when they're specifically related to personnel and personnel issues, layoff recall, for example, obviously there's a lot of discussion around those. But other than that, no, we don't have a lot of discussion with our union leaders about policy. As the board knows, we do meet with our union leaders before every board meeting to go through items so they have the opportunity to look through and see if there's any discussion. I forget if it was Trustee Kermula or if it was you that said these are pretty boilerplate, these are pretty standard. Generally, if there's something that's of major concern, it's coming up as an individual item. But with the amount of legislation that's out there in Lansing, we know that it's constantly changing our policies. So if anything, I wish we didn't have to spend money on a policy company to update policies. Right. Well, and I think that's what I was trying to highlight is, you know, since we're having a kumbaya session tonight of what's going right, I mean, that's another piece of the relationship is that we do sit down with our union leaders ahead of meetings and say, hey, this is what's on the agenda. Absolutely. Relationships are very important. So, yeah, and any member of the public can page through and see where the choices that we've made, where we have choices. But for the most part, most of these pages are out of our control. Right. But here and there we make some additions, like the conflict of interest policy, applying it to things. And especially with this update, if you look, a lot of them were 10, 12-page policies where there were like two or three minor changes folded out. So even the changes that we did have this time were relatively minor. All right. I'll entertain a motion to approve these policies as presented. Moved by Ms. Kermuller. Second. Seconded by Mr. Dieben-Krause. Any discussion on the motion? All right. Roll call, please. Kermuller? Yes. Lentoff? Yes. Cooney? Yes. Weathers? Yes. Dieben-Krause? Yes. Edmund? Aye. Yes. With six yes and zero no, the motion passes and the policies are approved. Thank you. Yes. I just want to say this. Okay. Yep. I was just making sure that you guys saw that she walked in. All right. Yeah. So without objection, we will go back to Kermuller. Yes. Item 3.1, which is the conflict of interest policy. Without objection, we will go back to Kermuller. Go back to item 3.2. And Ms. Rivas will address the board about what's happening at Ferndale High School. Yeah, no problem. I'm sorry. I was having car trouble. Oh, no. I apologize. That's okay. Do you need any help with the car? No. There's a lot of us here. It's good now. Thank you. I was having some engine troubles. I had to get a jump start. Oh, I'm sorry. We've all been there. I made it. We're here. First thing I want to talk about was the band concerts and the choir and orchestra concerts. We had amazing attendance. The band concert was on December 3rd. We had the symphony band and the wind ensemble. They did amazing. I was there. Personally, my brother's in it. He's a freshman this year. The choir and orchestra concert was on December 12th. We have about 35% of the school body, the student body, is in either choir, orchestra, or band. So we're very proud of that. We just casted roles 
recently for the Spring Musical, which is the Putnam uh, County Spelling Bee. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of it. It's kind of new. Um, the dates have been consolidated onto one weekend. The matinee is March 17th. And uh, it opens March 18th, 19th, and 20th. The 18th and the 19th are both 7.30 shows, and the, the 20th is a 3 p.m. show. We, this past Saturday, we held our uh, second SAT camp. We had about 70 students, approximately about 70 students, uh, took the work key part of the test. Yeah, so, and we'll, we'll get the scores back to them by the end of break or when they're supposed to be come back from break. Um, they also did two reading samples as uh, like two reading samples from the test that they're going to be taking. This past Sunday, we, had, we held the Senior Citizen Luncheon. Uh, that's hosted by USA. I'm, oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm a part of USA. And um, it's one of our like most cherished like events. We, we, that's like, it's like our baby. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is my last year in USA since I'm graduating and it was really hard to let it go. I was very excited. They're, they were all like wishing me goodbye. And I was like, oh, okay. I almost teared up. <laughs> um, wrestling to sports news. Wrestling just won the Marine Corps Choice for Tots uh, tournament. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we ha also had an individual winner, Kobe Davis, who won gold medal in his class uh, weight challenge. And um, Saturday the 19th, December 19th, we have, it's coming up this Saturday, uh, we have a basketball game against UHS. It's kind of like a interdistrict rivalry. Um, we have 11.30 game, it's the JV boys. Uh, one o'clock game is girls varsity, so it's both girls and boys against each other. Um, I mean, not against each other, but it's bo both of the teams. Um, and then we have our boys varsity team at 3 p.m. So I hope to see you guys there. Nice. And that's all from my end, sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much, no Crystal. Problem. Thanks a lot. If it doesn't start again, I'm sure we have someone that has jumper cable. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh dear. Um, item 8.3 is a request to approve the first budget amendment of <coughs> fiscal year 2016. Ms. Huber will present that. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so this is our first uh, budget amendment for the 2016 year. Um, as you can see, we've made um, some substantial uh, increases, both to revenue and expenditures, which um, is a good thing. Um, the major change is revenue. Um, we're very conservative in um, our in the number of uh, students that we projected, um, and um, the enrollment. Uh, those areas did a really great job. Um, working to make sure we got as many students in as we could. And because of that, um, we had a very large increase over our projected enrollment of about 277 students. Um, again, this is an unaudited number. Um, so, and I was talking to Cindy earlier and she said, yes, they're already starting to um, deduct for the students. Um, they deduct students that move by month up until the second count, so they've already started to <laughs> take those few students away from us, but um, otherwise it's a really um, great change. Um, well, they, they also give us students that we've taken yes, from other yes, places. Yes, we get both. So. It, it's a swap back and forth, but yeah. the state has already started it. Unfortunately, um, you know, they've changed that and they do that by month now instead of um, just at the count date. Um, so this increase in revenue is offset um, by a reduction in the MIPSERS UAL, which again is a pass-through. Um, both the revenue side and the expenditure side um, because we were a little high in our um, projection of what that was going to be. Um, so there we're showing, so in state revenue it's about a $2.2 .2 million increase in revenue for a total increase in revenue of about $2.4 million um, from the original budget. On the expenditure side, we um, have increased total instruction by $1.2 million. Um, the majority of that is due to the increase of additional teachers that we've needed because of the additional students. So we added um, six elementary teachers. We added a .8 teacher at the middle school. Um, we have four teachers with additional class loads, which is where they decide to um, teach <coughs> on their prep hour. 
as well as we've had um, teacher overages that, that we will be paying for that um, increase in class size. Um, and that's a majority of the increases in instruction. It takes us um, from about 52%, 52.5% of our expenditures in total in, in basic instruction to 53.75. So we are heading in the right direction and um, showing that the majority of our increase in expenditures is going directly into the classroom. Um, at the same time, if we look at total support services, um, that has gone down from just under 1%. So even though we did increase um, there, the total percentage of those expenditures has gone down by about 1%. So we really are trying to focus um, and increase the instructional expenditures and um, put more money in the classroom and keep it out of the support area. Um, in, the, um, in the instructional staff area, um, that increased about 24%. Um, and that was from some additional staff that we needed at CCEC um, because of the increased enrollment. So we've added um, an additional data analyst there as well as um, an addition, we um, added supervision there. We've also um, established a textbook budget, which um, in our original budget, we did remove that. Um, and we were trying to balance our budget at, at the beginning. Um, and so we've um, added that back in. And also CCEC um, with their section 107, with adult ed and their section 107 funding, they were able to purchase some computer parts with the additional allocation they got. Um, so those are some of the increases that were in that area. So this takes us, um, our original budget, we were uh, projecting an ending fund balance of 442,000, which is about 1.42% of revenue. And I've changed this um, to make it fund balance as a, percent of as a percentage of revenue, because this is what the state looks at um, as a percentage of revenue, not as a percentage of expenditures. When they're looking at um, whether or not um, we're hitting the 5%. Okay. So I've changed that. Um, and with the additional revenue, minus the additional expenditures, plus the change, um, the increase in the projection from the audit, we are now looking at um, an addition to fund balance, and we're looking at an end ending fund balance of 1825813 which gets us to about 5.44%. situation that was fairly, it was critical, really, um, to where CCC was in tr trouble. And is, uh, is there still a sense that there's declining enrollment in Kenwin? Yes, yeah, so overall, um, obviously the, the, the fully audited counts haven't come out, but in general conversations with our superintendents, um, generally most districts have seen a continued decline as they have, um, with the exception being South Lyon. <coughs> And they've, they've been seeing increases for years just because of new subdivisions. But um, it's, been the general, it's been a general decline within the county. I think when it comes out, we'll see an overall um, enrollment decrease countywide. Well, I know we, in the, uh, on the sustainability committee, we, uh, what we call the finance committee, we talked uh, quite a bit about, spent some time talking about the uh, instructional additions extra teachers we were adding on, um, and then looking at the financial report with Selco and the packet. Uh, well, that was a tough comment, but the, the uh, financial report and the, and the uh, fed into this in a similar format, and uh, things are, are going along according to plan, and, and uh, everything seems to be well managed, and we'll continue to keep an eye on things. And our goal is to continue to increase instructional spending, do our best to decrease that instructional spending, and, and keep our fund equity above 5%. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the budget amendment number one as presented. Moved by Ms. Keeney. Seconded by Ms. Lacoste. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, roll call please. and the budget amendment is approved. Thank you. Next up is 
8.4, request to approve the Ferndale Middle School Coding Class Pilot. Ms. Rocha will present that. Or introduce that, I should say, not present. Um, good evening. Tonight we're going to share with you some good news about some of the um, coding activities that are taking place at our, our actually all of our campuses, um, starting at Ferndale Middle School. And Lauren will share with you what um, some of our other schools did with the Hour of Code last week. But everyone is really into this computer science and it's um, becoming more and more popular with our students. Um, so based on an after school club that Lauren started at Ferndale Middle School, we are not now asking um, to start a pilot coding elective. One of our goals is to have some more academic type of electives for our students um, with this. And as soon as our high school teachers heard that we were piloting this at the middle school, they are already asking if it's going to happen at the high school shortly. So with that, I will introduce Lauren. She will go through this short PowerPoint and share some of our success stories to date. CS First program. Um, Google CS First, if you don't already know, stands for um, Google Computer Science First. Um, and I have been piloting the program in the form of a club, an after school club at Ferndale Middle School um, for the past month or so. We'll wrap it up this week. Um, and it has been going phenomenally. Um, we also, last week was Computer Science Education Week. Um, and we had uh, a teacher at every single building in the district participate in our which is basically bringing in, um, connecting to the curriculum, existing curriculum, and introducing students to coding and um, getting them excited about it and showing them that anyone can learn to code um, and that they can pick up basic coding skills within the context of an hour. Um, and so that was um, fantastic. We did that um, kindergarten class all the way up to high school level, um, and it was very well received. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Computer Science First program, um, as that is what we are looking at as the basis for our curriculum um, for the elective course at Ferndale Middle School. Um, the CS First program is a free resource. It's a free computer science club um, put out by Google. Um, it utilizes uh, Massachusetts in Institute of Technology's Scratch programming, um, web-based program. It's an introduction to coding. Um, it, it uses blocks as its coding language, which is basically the foundation for JavaScript, um, which is pretty exciting. Very, very approachable um, for all students of all ages. Um, and this program is designed for students who are familiar with coding or students who are brand new to coding. Um, it, its entry level is, you know, it's got challenges. It's also got very basic instruction, um, and it's very student-led um, as far as the program. So I just wanted to walk you through a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, why computer science? Number one, it, it has piqued the students' interest. Um, they've basically been stuck with consuming many materials, and you know we see them consuming materials on computers all the time. Um, but we want to encourage them and empower them to be able to actually create those materials. And that is um, what computer science can give to them, um, and what learning just the foundational skills in coding can enable them to do animation, can able, enable them to build their own games, um, to exercise things that they're already um, using in their curricular content areas, um, and make them actually come to life. Um, so an example of their creating versus consuming. So they're actually building programs, animations, um, different things based off of different themes. Um, another reason that um, we're really interested in bringing this program to our students is because we know that it's growing and we know that it's not going anywhere. Um, this is a nationwide statistic um, from code.org um, and this is something that we shared during Hour of Code as well, that no matter what career you're interested in, you can find some sort of connection to coding and to, to computer science and that the jobs are growing and it's time for you to make that switch. <coughs> um, another reason that I'm passionate about bringing this program um, to our students is because 75% of our population is underrepresented in computer science. Um, 
so explaining to students that we want to get them interested, particularly at the middle school level, bringing in that early exposure so that we are able to change that statistic that we see up there with females, you know, and students of color not being represented in the computer science. Even Google admits itself with their demographics that they have the same problem. In our Google CS First Pilot Club, we have the same problem. So I'm hoping that in bringing it actually in as an elective course, we will bring in more, you know, make it more accessible to all students rather than make it, you know, just stick to the stereotype that the English department. And there has been research to prove that early exposure to a subject can generate interest and curiosity while building your competency. And I can see that firsthand within the program. So, you know, while they're building that identity, making them comfortable with coding and showing them that they do have the capacity to do this, I think will enable them in the future to consider, you know, using this type. The CS First Key Objectives are courage to try new things, confidence when using computers in general, just building even just general computer skills, scrolling and, you know, just watching a video and comprehending. Perseverance is huge to tackle difficult problems. This is project-based learning. If they don't build their code correctly, it's not going to work. So then they have to go back and they have to try again. So they definitely are working on their perseverance and collaboration as well. And we're hoping that it will have an impact on both our community and their future career needs. We also hope to build a sense of belonging and tech for underrepresented students, so giving them a place where this is accessible to them. Just a little bit about the program. We have been running it as a club, but it's very flexible. There are themed sessions, so those are the themes up there. We started with storytelling, which I can say is interesting whether you're, you know, no matter in what grade level you're approaching it, it's been designed so that it's just a very high interest theme. And each of these has about 10 hours of content across the different sessions. So we would take all of those themes and incorporate them into the curriculum of the elective course because it would all fit perfectly. And the class structure just kind of looks like an opening discussion. And the great thing about this is even myself not necessarily having the deepest background in coding, this is meant to be facilitated by people who might not be super comfortable with coding because you're building skills right alongside the student. You're learning right alongside them. So with some foundational knowledge, you're able to facilitate their coding knowledge without necessarily having to be able to write extensive code yourself, which is great to be able to have that opportunity without necessarily needing all the skills. We then usually move into showcasing projects. So we'll take student projects, put them up on the board, talk about them, you know, highlight things that were easy about it, difficult, oh, you know, how did you do that? How did you make them spin? That kind of a thing. And then they use the CS First curriculum, which is basically they have videos and challenges that they have to complete. So they'll watch a video and then have to try something. Then they'll watch another video, have to try something else. And at the end, they'll have built some sort of project. So every session involves some sort of task that they have to accomplish. And then at the end, they'll usually close and then share out with each other what they've done. And here's some of the impact from our specific students. Those are actually our Google CS First Club. Down at the bottom, that is their, at the end of each session, they have quick little surveys that they take. And so I look forward to doing Computer Science Club, strongly agree or agree. I've been successful so far in this club, strongly agree and agree. I would recommend this club to a friend. So all very positive feedback from these students. Again, they're voluntary participants, but, you know, they also could volunteer to not show up the next day, and they do. So it is good. They also, I think, said something about the rigor of this program. Do you think computer science is difficult? After completing some of this, they said, most of them admitted, yeah, it can be difficult at times. But the next question is, do you think it's worth the effort? And pretty much all agree that, yes, most of the time, it's definitely worth the hard work and the rigor and, you know, the problem solving that I have to go through to be able to do this coding. So I think that's great feedback straight from our program that we put together. 
what we need to start basically with this Google CS First Collective is a lab, a teacher host. Google CS First provides all the rest of your supplies. Um, so they pr provide an online platform for you to assign usernames and passwords for the students and then the teacher keeps track um, of all of that data. Um, they have task force and badges just as a motivational tool as well for them to monitor their own progress um, through CS First. Um, and then there's also plans and solution sheets that can help the teacher as she's trying to go through the class. Um, I did want to show you just a really quick example of what this looks like. This is a method for the staff to have this kind of survey as a well-being study. So this is one of our experiments. And just to give you an example of what prep looks like, again, they're in the 40 pound version, so it's pretty small. Um, this is an interactive survey. speaks of the, um, the flexibility of the board as well as the system of having a smaller school district. Um, you know, Ms. Rushmore's department, if you would ask at the beginning of the year, was this one of our necessary goals? Not necessarily, but as Lauren brought it to our attention and Ms. Ms. Rushmore department worked on it, you know, it fit with our goals as a school district. In other larger school districts, this would not be possible to do. Um, so it's really due to the work of the curriculum department and um, the flexibility of the size of our district being able to uh, adapt to our students and adapt what's out there in a timely manner. So, I have a question. Related to that, then, could you, are there, are there any other schools that have something similar or are you familiar with? That have um, computer science courses? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Google CS First incorporated into the curriculum. Um, I do know of technology courses at the middle school level that are using the curriculum. Mm -hmm. They might not only be using Google CS First, they might also be supplementing with something like Code Academy, which is very similar programming, um, just put it in a, you know, it, it kind of depends on the concepts that you're looking to teach your students and how long um, time frame mm -hmm. that kind of a thing, um, you know, what your format of your program is, and this particular program just kind of fits what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. And um, could you talk about, since it's, since if we're making it a class and it's no longer a club, mm -hmm. can you talk about how the assessment will work? So at the end of, that I pulled for you, that you saw the results on there, um, that is built into there. Um, however, I 
personally, each each lesson has a topic of some sort. Every um, lesson, there is a built-in assessment. Um, so like this, and that topic could be assessed. Um, so at the end of every you know lesson that they've completed, they work the book through. For example, that one was an interactive story. So there is a specific amount of code that needed to be in that story so that I knew that they knew how to make an interactive story. And there's story. a rubric that the students will yes. be able to yep. mm -hmm. follow and then, and then get a grade yes. just like a regular class. Correct. <coughs> All right, so uh, on page, I'm not at it, the, the uh, what, how, and why in the curriculum for COVID-19 spelled on page 619. <laughs> <laughs> The curriculum was not 600 pages, just to be clear. No, it was just, it was about 400. <laughs> In depth. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve this uh, computer coding uh, pilot class as an elective at Ferndale Middle School starting in the second semester. Discussion on the motion? I guess just another question. So, mm -hmm. how um, we have it? No, we don't have a pilot program. No, this isn't the first pilot program here. Is yeah. do we have a standard um, evaluation we have at the end to determine whether we move forward with a pilot program? There, there isn't currently, um, but uh, probably within the achievement committee. Uh, we can develop that. There isn't. There is nothing within uh, policy or nothing within the district that's been there in the past. It's um, either within governance or achievement, depending on um, you know how how we want to deal with that. But that was something that could easily come up in the process mm -hmm. or appeal. Thank you. I have another question. I don't know. Did this class? Did this class get students to access any of the SAT resources for the summer? Not for middle school. Oh, not for middle school. I'm talking about for high school. Is that correct? All right. Any other questions or discussion on the motion? Seeing none, may we have a roll call on the motion to approve the uh, pilot program? Madam Chair. Yes. 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 Six yes by Madison Thompson. Passes, and the uh, pilot class is approved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I just make a note that, yes. that she's done a great job of tweeting all of this out, so if you're not following her on Twitter, you should be. Oh. And I'm so happy to finally meet you face to face. I've been following you for several weeks, but um, the Hour of Code... The Hour of Code was a great hashtag to follow, and, mm -hmm. it, and there were um, kids doing computer programming throughout the whole district, and it was really, it's, I think it's been great. I saw a ton of that. I think it was like 10 to 20 following live in mm -hmm. my second grade or two years ago. That's great. Mm -hmm. And so what was your handle? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is our informational section. Um, so on line 21, the superintendent report. So one of the, the pieces that um, <coughs> we discussed some in, excuse me, <coughs> in the governance committee that I wanted to bring to the board uh, for discussion was looking at school board term policy. Uh, I believe right now, uh, Looking at the six-year terms, there were some discussions from the governance members of moving it down to four-year terms as something that's a little more palatable to, to people as they sign up for four years as, as opposed to six. Um, so I, as a superintendent, I didn't necessarily have any uh, opinion, honestly, either way on it. Uh, it, it depends on uh, what we need to see for the community to continue to attract good board members. So I just kind of wanted to bring that forward and see if there's any any questions from board members regarding that. Um, as well as a little bit little bit of uh, discussion regarding that or your thoughts. Um, Kevin, you had uh, 
Edna Allegra at the Juvenile Delinquency Fund, Joe Rozelle at the Oakland County, the Oakland County Director of Elections and the Clerk's Office. Yeah, I spoke with you on the contact in 2010. The school board voted to change the election date. That was in line with the concerns of the school board. We wanted to have elections at the same time that they did that in Los Angeles back in 2010. So we chose to do it. I think a number of us went to lunch to think about that for a while. I don't know if at the time many things were changed that put a delay on it. But also because the school planning people there were all in on the destination of money for the money that they were supposed to be spending on their own programs and making the jobs of their elected other officials at the school board. And so we've done some investigating on this. There don't seem to be any major downsides to the procedures we've got before you. The only argument that's come up has been that when you do the issue before you, you are then required to have an election every six years. We're always on the school committee. There's three or four board members that have been elected so that there is a potential for the amount of time that we could get membership. Mark Wessler, who is the board recruiter, is that even with a dramatically equal board membership, you don't necessarily win the issue one way or the other. There are a lot of bigger changes in school board membership than we could have had from Attorney Groff and Attorney Giardini and the two people who aren't elected, but as much time as they bring. And there's no problem, actually, with four school board members registered to be served on the school board. They would still be able to serve because it's one line of school board anyway, and they're still going to have a number of elements that they're electing. And given that we've already lived through the most extreme case scenario, and I think we've done fairly well in the budget and other situations, there doesn't seem to be any reason not to let us do it here. So I spoke to Joe Rozelle at Oakland County about the coming election. He said that we cannot, by law, close these things, and we need to keep it sort of a staggering amount of time so that there are five elections in every year and four elections every two years and so on and so forth. And given those restrictions, we can't actually at the current moment do anything with any upcoming elections, but what we could do is make the determination that our assumption is would be earlier elections and that would still be done through the school board and that would be the first time that these elections are affected in any of these, but we wouldn't be doing this with any kind of delay. So that's the concern that we do need to be prepared to close. And with that, I would yield to the rest of the board members. Okay. So in 2016, there were two seats up. In 2018, two. And then, well, I guess there are three and four. And just to piggyback, I was having Judge Bybee ask Mr. Hines about his work in Janice's work. That was determined to be a limited time job with Mr. Hines. However, there is a contract that he elaborates to board members and they do get a chance to vote for the school. So as of now, it is probably always going to happen that the school board members who have elected members do not have to vote for them in the school board. They do all choose in the school board who they want to vote for, which does lead to the obvious choice of the common elected board members who are set aside by contract to accept these position issues because of the way that they have to. I'm thrilled about this. And I think Mr. Hines ought to be too. I think it's... You can tell in your voice. Just a little bit too late for that. Well, I mean, it was very exciting to have so many people show up at that election where we did vote for the Oakland School Board. And knowing that the folks at the community did not support it and to show up there was... It was hard to be able to vote when you had those people. What I think is really interesting is this idea that a school board can be replaced by someone. So we couldn't vote to increase term. Not the young folks, by the way. But we can't... We can't vote to decrease the term of an existing... Well, we can't vote to decrease the term of an existing board member. And if we were to vote to decrease the term for 2016, we would be left with an issue on the school board. No, no, no. I totally get what you're saying. I just think it's interesting that then you could vote to increase and then time was bumped on five years, which was fine, but nobody had to vote for it. That's fair enough. And there were... I mean, I think it's important to mention at the time, and you can tell, if I 
Dillon where it says that the Dillon claims have to get a certain percentage of the fees from the 19th statement of interest rate to the one year from the date of the claim and then the fees are offset from the date of the claim. I think that's what it says. So what I hear is that it would be advisable for the superintendent to bring this back to governance. I would love that. To then to craft a... Maybe not. So, yeah. Where was I going to say? So, yeah, this will go to governance for a first read. Oh, yeah, and the superintendent also ran this by NASD's legal counsel, which is already included in the price of our membership. So, I wouldn't say free, but... And he also approved the language, so this will go to governance on January 9th. Today being actually the anniversary of Sandy Hook, I wanted to bring to the board some of the things we're doing with crisis planning. Actually, as of today, speaking with our police liaison, she will be going to an updated training to bring back to the district. We're updating our crisis plans. I've met with every municipality, including the state police, in terms of readiness and preparedness with the buildings. I will be doing some more drills once we get into the spring with the work the board's already approved on the wall by the band room that will make our campus here secure for the first time. We put all the cameras in, obviously, during the summer, put the door buzzers in. So, we're continuing our crisis planning. There's some updating that we need to do within the different buildings, but that's something that we're ongoing. So, I think it's always important for us to be ready and also let the community know that it's something that is in the forefront of our mind. We hope nothing major ever happens. It is such a low likelihood, but as we learned in Sandy Hook, their readiness was what saved many children. So, we have great relationships with the local police departments, and we'll continue that, and we'll make sure that we do everything we can to keep our students safe. So, any specific questions regarding crisis readiness or crisis preparedness? I just want to thank you for the calm confidence with which you've approached this. You just came in a variety of settings, and you ignored on the one hand the very serious part about this is a hot mess on the other hand. So, you're sort of in what is now a raging anxiety state. I don't need to be here with the city council to be very, very calm and peaceful and easy to speak with. That's all I have for my report today. Thank you. We didn't have any pulled consent agenda items, so we're on to Good Things to Try. So, go ahead. I just want to say, I'm going to try to reserve one minute and share here. Both proud of Terry Long having been a first board member, and proud of Mr. Long having been a first board member. Proud that his leadership has led to the fees that we have talked about, and the fees that we gave on here that she'll bring with her during the Good Things to Try campaign. Thank you. And I think that's all I have for today, but that sounded completely wrong. She's in a great place, and I'm glad she's there, but I also wish she were here. Just for clarification, Raylon is at a Ferndale City Council meeting tonight, which is not nearly as fun as our meeting. We've already established that. Not a better place. That's okay. Still fine. Do you get to watch talking heads in Good Things to Try? Right. I'll just, I'd like to go ahead and publicly acknowledge, you know, I'm always talking about the great supportive community we have here in Ferndale of our school community, and I just want to specifically thank 
our Ferndale Rotary Club for their pantry breakfast, which I didn't attend, but I know that it was some, it's something that they do every year, and it's, it's a fundraiser that they do to support scholarships for our students, and the Rotary Club is a great supporter of our district. Um, and another uh, place of business in Ferndale is Geno's, who recently hosted a fundraiser for Blessings in a Bad Hat, which is a, a program that our district is um, getting up and going. And so that's, uh, you know, Geno's is also always on the list of, of businesses to explore for, for our district, and I just wanted to um, give them a public shout-out. And Dean Mock, the uh, Ember, is also close to the Rotary, is that right? Exactly, so yes. So <laughs> it's all, all Area full Ember. circle. is our elementary teachers and our curriculum staff. Uh, today was another one of the days where they uh, were doing professional development, uh, preparing for next year. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of prep work, uh, but it really is student-focused, and, and it's all about our students achieving. Uh, so just watching the, the work that they're doing, uh, the interactions between the staff members and the teachers and the excitement that they have uh, for going into the next year and, and really uh, creating something special moving forward. Uh, so just excited whenever, you know, whenever you have a, a, a bad day, go watch teachers, go watch kids. Um, it's just great to see that excitement with our teaching staff. Uh, I want to point out as uh, one of my points of pride the uh, little courtyard area. It's dark right now, but if you ever walk by it and it's a light outside, that used to be sort of a weedy, neglected nest, and now it's very zen-like garden. Um, so I appreciate the people from the district that work worked on that. And then, uh, because I'm not going to uh, stand for election as president, I just wanted to thank uh, the board of administration, the community members, for all the support over the last three years as president. Will uh, continue to be on the board, but I guess I'll sit sit down at the end uh, next year. So, um, uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, a very exciting three years, <laughs> um, and I certainly appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Shepard and Mr. Pruitt for making uh, the job as president a lot easier and, and smoother over the course of the last few years. So, thank you very much. Next president will do a great job, and I'll do whatever I can to support her and the rest of the board to make sure the board members are happy. Well, thank you for all your service to us.
that I forgot to bring up earlier. Do you want to? Yes, yes, you have, uh, you have a valid case that works. for our students moving forward. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, when is the deadline for the student group it to go to court? Uh, So we'll be bringing more information as a, uh, as it's available. I'm taking the 26 oh. off the list. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that uh, brings us to our next regular board meeting, which will be on Wednesday, January 20th. Um, we, the uh, day because we're all in celebration, we've got the Martin Luther King Jr.'s <coughs> birthday, and uh, we have it on January 4th. Just we have uh, our special meeting um, preceding the organizational meeting to select a new board member. And the organizational meeting is where Julie signs the new select officers, that sort of thing. So uh, with those notes, we are adjourned at 8.32.